All right, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming. We're going to start today with a reminiscence um, activity, finding meaning in memories. The American Psychology Association says reminiscence therapy is the use of life histories, written, oral, or both, to improve psychological well-being. The therapy is often used with older people. Mining memories is good for people of all ages, and that includes adults with adult Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. So this week, I passed these out to help you guys think about it. We're going to do a reminiscence about our mothers. I put a whole bunch of questions on here to help people think about what they wanted to talk about. After I'm done talking, I'll break the ice. After I'm done talking, we'll go around the room and anybody who wants to add something, we would love to, um, we would love to have you share. The theory is, is that um, with memory loss, that the first memories in are the last memories out. And I know every time we have done the reminiscence th therapy here, the reminiscence thing, people have come up with memories that they forgot from a long time ago that help them really connect with their past. And the wonderful thing that I find about it is every time we've done it here, like when we did a reminiscence about growing up our childhood, everybody, everybody, black, white, Caribbean, we all had the same childhood. We all got thrown out of the house in the morning. We all played with sticks and stones and jacks because we had no money. So by the time we were done, we were so much clearer on all the stuff that brings us together. And this is a perfect way for you guys in your community to learn more about each other and to connect in a way that you wouldn't, you know, just sitting next to each other. So, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my mother. And then as I say, we're gonna go around, uh, around the room. Um, when my mother died, we did, um, one of my colleagues did a, a memory stick, you know how they do that now at the, at the funerals? So you can see all pictures of somebody. And she did a fabulous job, and it wasn't until today that I was looking at it for, um, to bring here with me today that I realized there is not a single picture of myself and my mother, the two of us, which kind of describes my relationship with my mother. I, was, uh, I came from a family of, um, of four girls, and the two older ones, myself and my older sister, were really tough. Um, we like to say by the time she had practice on myself and my older sister, she did much, much better with the two younger ones who had, uh, who had great relationships with her. But um, it's so interesting today because when I, when I had to think about talking about my mother, I had to really go back and, and ask myself, a, a lot of questions about, um, you know, what she was like, what was good about her, what was bad about her. Um, so I'm going to answer the question, how are you like her and how are you different? Um, my mother got married at 19. Um, she had her first baby seven months later, um, followed by four more in pretty quick succession. Um, she, was, she had a lot of troubles in her own life. She, uh, she had a lot of anxiety. There was a lot of, of stuff like that going on in her own family. And she was very, very needy. She was very, very attached to my dad. She was very, very needy. Oh, thanks. And so, um, so that we had kind of a, um, an odd upbringing, but uh, when she was 35, uh, a for a, a number of circumstances, she struck out on her own and she went, she became involved with the New School for Children in Roxbury. That was like the first community school that they started over here. She went back to school and she got her degree. She became an educator. She went to work for the federal government. Now all of this was happening at the same time that my older sister and I were hitting our teens. So, we were kind of wild children and she wasn't, didn't have a lot of time to pay attention to us. So years later, um, she came to me and my sister Darcy and she said, you know, I want to apologize for not being there for you guys when you were in your teens and you got in a lot of trouble and everything else. And I said, you know what, mom? 
that was the greatest thing that ever happened because we saw you go from a woman who was completely dependent on her husband, who couldn't make a decision on her own, to a woman who could, who made all her decisions, she went back, she recreated herself, she became an independent woman. And so when that happened, she really taught my sister and I a lesson, you know, that you can change later in life and that, you know, things can be very, very, you can recreate yourself at any point in your life. And the question is um, that I like is, how are you like her and how are you different? And the answer is, of course, is that I'm like her in every single way. You know, I'm like her in ways that I never even would have believed possible. I spent a lot of my life trying to be not like her, and I'm exactly like her. And if I am not paying attention to myself all the time, I make the same mistakes. But if I learn from her mistakes, and if I go back and really, really think about the good parts about her. She was huge for social justice. She was huge for the women's movement. She, we got kept out of school to go on civil rights marches. She worked in Roxbury. You know, she brought an awful lot to the table. Um, but I am so fascinated in groups like this because I love to have people talk about their mothers who had that totally different relationship with their mothers. Like, when people talk to me about like, oh my gosh, my mother was my best friend and stuff, it just, it opens up a whole new world for me. So I totally, totally love to hear people talk about experiences that are different than mine. So I'm gonna um, put down the mic. Everybody gets to look over the questions and pick a question. And uh, did you get it? Okay, great. And who wants to be brave and go first? Oh. Um. Maybe you guys can share one. Okay. So who's my first victim? Who's going to talk about their mother? Guys, you always talk. I don't have one. We've given them all away. I didn't expect this many people. All right, so we'll start with Arnetta. She would love to share about her mother. Arnetta? People that came in late. I don't have any more. Um, I'm going to bring you down the microphone. This one? This one's not working? Okay, but it's connected to this thing? So I just take it around? So if you want everyone to hear them, you need to use that microphone. This one's just for my camera. So I have to make them come up here? If, if you want everyone to hear them, yeah. This doesn't magnify like that. All right, I know. I know your name, so I'm going to start calling on names. Just picking on me, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Arnetta Beatty. Uh, my husband is sitting in the back in green. Uh, my mom and I, kind of like Chi, uh, we're, are very much alike. We're very much alike. My mom passed in 2009. And um, we were almost like sisters, even though she was born in 1925. I was born in 1952. But everywhere I went, I took her. She was very humble, very Christian, and did a lot for everybody. If she had $5 and you needed it, she'd give it to you. And I find myself, for the last, 10 or 15 years doing the exact same thing that she did. <laughs> um, she can tell you that I'm very community orientated, I'm very woman orientated, I'm very senior orientated. I like to make sure that seniors have the things that they need to have. They've been, we, we sometimes are the forgotten generation because the younger people say, oh, you're old. We, don't, we can't learn anything from you. You want to learn something for us. I flip it and say we can learn from each other. And my mom taught me that. I grew up in West Virginia in a small town called Rotafield. I came to Boston in 1971, 1970, and graduated from Jamaica Plain High School. And I've been here ever since. And I go back 
we're going, I was going back every five years just to visit my hometown. Uh, I haven't did that in about 10 years. When you lose your mom, you lose a big part of yourself. It took me a time, I'd say about a year or two to, to move on, but I still have her and we have been blessed when I say we, Carl and I, have been blessed with another mom. She never had any children, and we have been adopt we have adopted each other. She lives here in Boston, and she's 95 years old. She's not here. <laughs> I tried to get her to come, but she said no. She didn't feel like it, so. When she has those days when she doesn't feel like it, we don't push her. But maybe the next time she'll come. Thank you. All right, Carl, can we get a Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to throw a stone in the pond and cause a ripple. Um, my mother and I never really had a good relationship. Uh, very tumultuous relationship. Um, kind of touchy for me. Uh, I don't really like to talk about her. I, I, I was the, my, my mother was, was 19 when I was born and I was the oldest of, of five children. Um, my mother, uh, I, I was conceived by a, married, by a married man, so there was a lot of hurt in her story. And um, when he didn't leave his family for her, I, I guess I pretty much became useless. Uh, I, I served no purpose. Um, so, moving, moving forward, what I, what I what I had to, and I and I went through a long addiction and, and just messed myself totally up. But through that and, and through, through 12 steps programs, I learned that one, accept reality as it is, because nothing killing myself is not going to change the situation. One of the greatest things they taught me is that it's better to understand than it is to be understood. So I had to gain an understanding of what she went through. Um, the, 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 the shame that she had to carry. Uh, um, and, and, and you know, it, 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 it's funny. It, it, it's, it's a funny thing that two, two adults can do something and the child carries the shame. Two adults do, they commit the act and the child bears the name. The child becomes the bastard. Um, my mother died in 2012. And, and uh, we, I hadn't seen her, I guess, since 97. But before she died, I, I got a chance to make an amend. I didn't feel like I owed any amend, but I need to go and free myself. I need to go and free myself. So I took my wife and my best friend, and, and we went, and, and, and she, was, she was bedridden at the time. And, uh, I, I just went and sat. I just went and sat because I'm, I'm just going to come and sit and be a son. 
and, and I'm gonna give you an opportunity to be a mother. Um, don't think my childhood was miserable. It, it wasn't miserable. I, I, I was raised with my grandmother and my, 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 my aunts. My aunts and I, my, my youngest son is 13 years older than me, and my oldest son is 17 years older than me. So uh, um, I, I, I had family, and I was their practice kid. When my grandmother had to work, I went to stay with my great-grandmother. My great-grandfather chauffeur for the DuPont, so I was just a spoiled little kid. I had everything. I had, I had I was a kid with a sandbox. I, I had everything. So um, no, I didn't, didn't live a tortured life. And, and I think that the best thing, the best thing that coming up in the time I came up in, the best thing that she did for me was let me know that nobody owes you anything. Whatever you get out of life, you have to get it for yourself. Because if I had have been sitting waiting for somebody to hand me something, I wouldn't be where I am today. This is going to be like school, you know. If you don't volunteer, I, I know your name, so I'm going to be calling on it. Uh, be so long-winded. It's unfortunate that some parents who become parents at young ages, and we're talking way before the 40s and the 30s and whatever, uh, it was a hard task for them because then there were so many prejudices and what have you till parents just didn't know what to do. But in any event, let me just start with my mother. And I'll try not to take up too much of your time, because once I start talking about my mother and my father, but my mother today, dynamite, no education other than elementary school, but she had something else going on where she could pick up and learn from reading and the newspapers and what have you. She was a dynamite mother, involved with, just it was just my sister and I, just the two, three year, di three year difference. So my sister was older than I. But my mother died young. She was in her 50s, late 50s, when she passed. But she was involved with my school, whatever I was doing for homework, knowing that she really couldn't help me so much. But my sister was there to help me. She was three years older. And she had been where I became in elementary school and she went on to higher education and so forth. But my mother, they had meetings all the time at the elementary level. And all the teachers loved my mother's lemon meringue pies. And she would bring that. And it would be gone so fast. I think most of the teachers took it rather than the other parents that were there whenever we had these programs going on. Uh, I can't say enough about her. I am so proud, and I'm a lot like her in personality. Much more so than my sister was. But I made it all good when things were so bad for my mother in growing up. <sighs> Raised by all, all of you will be able to analyze that for yourself because we're all in the same position, really, as far as our birth dates 
We were all in the late 30s, early 40s, and I was 1940. July 4th, just had a birthday, 1940. Well, my mother didn't have the education, but she wanted to make sure. This is my mother and father, too, because they, they were married a long time, just so you know. Um, we had to go further in school because they did not have the opportunity. But we did. Even though it was during the wartime and times and all of that and turning your lights off at night so the airplanes wouldn't see. And would, oh, it was just, every time I think about things like that, it's like, I'm blessed with all the things that went on during our era. You have no idea, but it still turned out to be good because of my parents always being involved with something that they never thought that they would have to be involved with because they were not educated. But you would think that they were because of their personalities. They gave a lot. They took care of other people's children. And they were just involved with everything that my sister and I would do. And we earned that love, that kind of love. Not everybody had that. So this is why I say that I and my sister, we were blessed for my parents not to have education, only go to elementary school half the time. I don't think they, as a matter of fact, my dad didn't even finish that because he was the oldest of 14 children. My dad, handsome, my mother, they complimented each other. And I grew up like them, loving everybody, giving, doing whatever I can to make it better for somebody else because I had it so good. And it's the parents that have to be behind you. You can't allow your kids to grow up by themselves because they don't know anything. Going to school doesn't teach them everything, how you bring up a child or whatever. But I'm telling you, I must tell and let all of you know that I was blessed. My mother's name was Lucille. L-U-C-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. That's my middle name. And that's Gloria Lucille Curry, my maiden name and now Thomas. But I am just so thrilled. I have one daughter that I raised like my mother raised me. Very fortunate. A few of you might have met her the last time that I was here. I have just the one child, but she, she's superb, really good. Went to college on to higher education, as I did, as my sister did, and so forth. And I'm going to, I know, I will go on and on about my parents. So I was thinking, am I going to get up there and talk? She, my daughter says, Mommy, just, just cut it short, because I know how you felt about your mother and your father. But I thank you for listening, and I, I believe I had everybody's attention. So that is good. It gives you something to think about. So, okay, so who's going to, Sharon, did you want to, no, no, nothing about your mother? So nobody else has anything to say. Look at all the questions. You don't have to do the hard ones. There's all kinds of great ones. Like, here we go. Let me see if I can stretch this over a one. I think it's so intimidating that people have to have stand up. Okay, great. Please sit. Go ahead. Um, what I want to say about my mother is she was devoted to my father. So I'm from Washington. But they moved everywhere. But they ended up living in uh, upstate New York. And when I used to go up there, 
When I used to go up there on vacation, I didn't really like it because I was the only one. And when I was in Washington, I had a lot of aunts. Mm -hmm. I had cousins. So, and, but my mother wanted me to stay with her. I have to say she did. She wanted me to stay in New York, but I didn't want to. I wanted to come back where the chaos was in Washington. <laughs> but um, she was such a good mother as far as sending me packages, sending money, sending whatever, coming to visit us. She come down to give me my lecture when I was in high school. But she still was devoted to my father. I always remember that. And I was devoted to my grandmother. So I still love her, and I know she loved, she loved me. But it's something about that grandmother when, they, when you bond with them. Right. And they get upset if you gotta go, and you get upset. So I just wanted to, I give her credit. She was a very good mother. She thought about me, but I still didn't spend as much time as I could have. And I came up here on vacation. I met my husband, and I've been up here since 78. OK? So I must love Boston, too. <laughs> Thank you. You know, we're not limited to mother stories. Grandmother stories work just as well. Whoever mothered you. Well, hello. I have, I was raised by my grandmother from as a baby to say 12. And then I came to live with my mother who lived in Boston. I grew up in the South. As what I remember, my mom was a, a good mom. She was loving, but I never heard her say she loved me. But by her actions, I could tell that she loved me. She was sort of a disciplinarian. She was also a child raising a child. So by the time I was 13, the two of us started to conflict mm -hmm. because I felt she should be raising me or saying anything to me. If anybody was going to say anything, it should have been my grandmother. So we had to work through that, which we did. and. Um, she was an excellent cook, and she fed anybody who came to the house. Um, she loves fishing, too much fishing. She could fish every day, all day, but she would make me go, and I hated it. So that was something we quarreled about. Um, she also is so much different than, than I am. Uh, I'm different than she was. She was short, a small little lady. Nobody thought I was her, her daughter. But she was spicy. She, if you said something she didn't like, she would jump in your face in a minute. She did not back down. The only problem I have with her is that she always felt she was right. <laughs> she knew everything. She was smart. She was smarter than me because she could do those puzzles, the New York puzzles and all those. But she just wouldn't take your advice, right? Or she would maybe she did and she just didn't tell you. So she died in 2000 and I truly miss her. I miss her mac and cheese more than anything. And now I'm thinking she used to make things that like cakes that I didn't like. But all of a sudden now as I'm older, I would love to have that cake or have that recipe that, that she uh, used, which she didn't use many recipes. So she was 18 when I was born. And um, I guess that's why my grandmother raised me most of the time. So, yeah. But she was sweet and she had her own mind. And when I got 22, she divorced my father and she took off and just enjoy her life. She always said she would never be the grandmother who sat on the porch and rocked the children, and she didn't. Okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
And I was the only child. So. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. That's a great story. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have cooking stories or recipe stories, things their mother made that my mother, we don't have any of her recipes, so we the same thing. I miss a bunch of stuff that mm -hmm. I don't know how to make. Oh, everybody had a mother. Come on, er thank you. Everybody had a mother. <laughs> yes, ma'am. because I like to do a variety of things. She used to knit, crochet. She, when she passed, she was an artist. And I like the same things she did. I grew up with her teaching me how to, how to knit and uh, sew and make different things. And, um, and I'm different because my mother was at home, stayed here take care of the family and everything. I like the party. So I grew up in that generation. Probably because I was the youngest out of five and you know, my brothers would go party. So, you know, or if I party, they chaperoned me. So that, that's what we did. Okay, let me see. Um, what's one? I can't say. What's one thing I didn't understand? I, I can't say. I understood everything she told me. And, and growing up, we didn't speak that much. Everything was a nod or an eye, so you understood. Don't do that. You know what I mean? And you, and you spoke when you came into a room or when you got up in the morning, which our kids don't understand now. Okay. Um, I don't know how she met my dad specifically, but I know he was from, he's from Nova Scotia. You know, we uh, brought up uh, American Indians. And um, let me see. And then I believe they moved to uh, Malden Everett. And that's where they, uh, they really specifically met. OK. I didn't, let me see. What was her life before she had kids? I guess she, she was studying to be a nurse. And she did that for a short time until she became ill with, uh, with asthma, very severe asthma. Let me see. Um, let's see. What family tradition you got from, okay. What family tradition you got from her uh, do you cherish the most? Um, I don't know. So many things. Um, I guess it's the um, the upbringing and how she brought me up and how I brought my children up as to respect everyone, not just the the elderly or your friends or somebody else's mother and father. It's even the younger ones, and that's what my my children do today. And we weren't brought up just white and black. We were brought up with all nationalities. I could take my children anywhere. We used to go to parties when they're handicapped children. And my boys were only about six or seven, and they would help them. And this is what we were taught. Okay. Um, what 
Did your mama work? Okay, my mother did not work outside the home. Uh, was your mother a good cook? She was a damn good cook. <laughs> she, was, she was a good cook. Um, what were your favorite foods? Well, I had a lot of favorite foods, but one in particular is pasta. And I carried on the tradition with my children. She would be cooking pasta one or two o'clock in the morning, and I could smell it. It would wake me up when we would get up and eat spaghetti. So when my, my children grew up, especially the oldest one, he was about maybe four, I'd get up and do the same thing. I would go wake him up, and we would sit down and eat pasta. And he loves it still from today. <laughs> um, let's see. Valerie, does his kids wake up at 1 o'clock in the morning and eat pasta? When they were small, I used to wake them up and eat it. Because I, I was up cooking it, so. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of things I'd like to ask her, but I have so many I can't say right now. Um, the, uh, the thing I regret of uh, not asking her, I don't know, like anything else, you wanted to stay around. I know when she was, she'd been passed about 10 years now. And I was trying to say to her, because you know she started failing, and I wanted her to hang around for her 85th birthday. And she was getting close, and God took her home two weeks before. Um, let's see, when did you realize it was? When did I realize it was no longer a child? when I had a child. <laughs> Thank you. a young kid. I remember everything my mother did. She helped all the sisters. When they would break up with their husband, they would come and stay with us. So therefore, you know, it's like having another mother in the house with all those sisters. But anyway, as my mother went on, she was a cook at the school. She used to cook at the high school. I went grave school and stuff, right? So in grave school, where she was to cook in the cafeteria, they cooked some collard greens. My mother's famous for collard greens and stuff. And I didn't eat collard greens. As a kid, I did not eat collard greens. So the principal decided to beat me in my hand because I would not eat the collard greens. I went right to the cafeteria and got my mother, and she went up there with her hatchet, and she said to him, she doesn't eat collard greens at home. He said, I thought she was kidding. She says, no. You know when I ate collard greens, I was 36 years of age. My daughter asked me, I could cook them. She says, mom, cook me some collard greens. So I cooked the collard greens for her. I called my mother long distance. I said, guess what? She says, what? I said, I ate some collard greens today. <laughs> some said, taste it. So when I tasted, it, I liked them. I've been eating them ever since. But that's the only green I eat is collard green. I don't eat the rest of them, but I eat that. But anyway, getting back to my mother, 
2010, I was working. I got hurt on my job, right? And um, it took me a while. During that time when I got hurt, my mother had a stroke, okay? So you know, I was miserable because I couldn't go and see my mother because I couldn't walk, I couldn't do anything. But finally, I kept praying. I went to see my mother. And when I, when I went to see my mother, right, you know, it was sad for me and stuff. My mother lost her voice. She cannot even talk today. When you say cooking, I used to get on the phone and call my mother, how do you make this, Ma? And I would have me a pencil and a piece of paper and I'd be writing it down. Now, the only thing I have not learned how to master yet is she makes sweet potato pie on top of the stove. I have not learned how to master that yet. And I can't talk to her to really find out how to do that, right? But I give a lot of credit. She's 88 years of age today. She's in a wheelchair. She's very strong. She goes to the stove. She cooks for herself. She does everything. So I said to her, I never call my mother and tell her when I'm coming home. I like to surprise her. So I went home, and she came around the bend in her scooter. I said, well, hello there, Mrs. Thomas. The expression on her face meant so much to me. Okay, but you know, I'm grateful that she's still alive and she's doing good today. So, thank you. Thank you. I know the recipe for something I didn't do right in it. difficult for most persons that were our ethnicity. Um, my mom and my father were loving parents. They worked hard. We grew up on a farm. There were seven kids, and I'm the youngest girl. Therefore, if you're the youngest girl and you know you had a lot of chores to do, most of them were in the house, but still, being a girl among all the other guys who basically lived on the farm, guys did the hard work out in the farm area, and you had the house to take care of. Um, I lived in the South until I was about 13 years of age. Mom took care, basically, of running the household. She also would help out in the farm area because my dad worked for the North and Western Railroad. My dad was not home until on the weekend. When he was home on the weekend, um, he basically looked, you know, he had to take care of us, but when you work on the railroad and you are black, you did the hard work, okay? So by the time he got home to his family, he was too tired to do most of anything else. He got home on a Friday um, afternoon. He left Sunday morning. So there wasn't much time that he spent with his family. But he, we had quality time with him. He was like a kid with seven kids. But he was like a kid. And we all was just so happy to have him because my mom, loving as she was, she was strict. And I guess if you have seven kids, you have to be strict. Um, and if you're basically raising those kids, you have to be that way. But once I left home, and I left home at 13, not on my own, not because I had a choice, but if you remember integration desegregation, and you grew up in the South, you knew in many instances the only way that you got an education was that you had to leave home. You had to go to other places in order to get an education. 
and my parents' focus was you, their kids will do better than they did. And my parents made sure that all the kids had an education. The ones that were um, around my age, we had to go to either another part of Virginia, I grew up in Virginia, or we had to come to New York or Massachusetts or Pennsylvania in order to get an education. If you grew up in the South, you know coming from the South, going to the North is another nightmare because your <laughs> custom is, is totally different than growing up in the South. However, I was able to overcome that. I came to live with my sister and my brother-in-law in Cambridge, Mass. And I was able to complete school there. I have um, three and a half years of college. I have a son and a grandson, so I've done pretty well. But basically, I give it all to my parents and mostly my mother and also my mom prayed for us. She prayed for every child. She took care of other kids who lived in, in that community. But I have to say the sacrifices that she made for us got us to where we are today. And I think that's about it. Beautiful. I don't want to go on. <laughs>
didn't like. I don't fuck with my parents, so I can't. I can't be mad about it. Uh, like I said, no, not a, a, a higher education or anything, but it's something back during that era that parents had, and if they weren't raised by their parents, the people in their era turned over and loved those kids. More so than the parents would think God is in charge. Mm -hmm. So even though the parents didn't raise them, He sent other so people, like this lady just said, to raise them mm -hmm. and be blessed by, and they will be blessed by doing that. How are you like her? How are you different? I said I'm just like my mother, personality <coughs> and everything. Uh, it's like once you meet me, you don't forget me. <laughs> I am really. Uh, what's one thing you never understood about your mother? The only thing I understood about my mother is that there was nothing really to understand because we had it so hard. Like people were saying, back during that era, it was hard to, to go to college. It was hard to move on. Half the mothers were working at somebody's house, cooking and taking care of their children. Right, right. It, it was just so different. It was a whole different era. What, what's one thing you never understood? Okay, how did she meet your dad? Well, in South Carolina, I really don't know, because I don't think that I ever asked my mother that. So I'm finding it difficult to ask how she met my dad. But in so doing, which God allowed her to meet my father, and my father to meet her, it lasted for a long time. He outlived my mother, unfortunately, but they, they were just too, I looked a lot like my father, but my personality was my mother. What was her life like before she had kids? I don't really know, because we didn't really discuss that so much, but it wasn't easy. Again, it was the era we were in, come on, very few were wealthy or whatever. It, it's just so different. But at least when we talk about it, you guys are from my era, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, what was her life like? Okay, what family tradition you got from her do you cherish the most? Is that when God is good to you, What's so wrong with you giving back to other people? You can't really give to God. God's, well, even though God is in spirit, but still, you just, um, I cherish everything about both of my parents. Did your mother work outside the home? Yes, she did. Yes, she did. And taking care of other people's children. She had some experience when she had us. Was your mother a good cook? Oh, fantastic. Like I said about the little rain pot. She just would cook everything. And later, after my mother passed, I realized how good my father could cook. It was really fantastic. Is there anything you'd like to ask her? No. Anything you regret not asking her again? No, no, no. I don't know. When did you realize you were no longer a child? I don't think we really think about that so much. It just happens. It just comes. Before you know it, you're a sweet 16, and before you know it, you're 21. And if you're going to college, it's even more so. So, I, I just think this was a good thing to talk about, because then you can kind of cherish yourself on how you were raised. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> so the reason for that last question is when did you realize you were not, not a child anymore? Um, the first Quake, we're, we're Irish, but we weren't Quake. Like a lot of Irish people really like Quakes and funerals. My family didn't like
like them so much. So the first one I ever went to was my grandmother. And my dad was crying and crying and crying. And I was like, Dad, you know, come on. She's mom's old, you know, blah, blah, blah. He said, gee, there's nobody left who remembers me when I was a little kid. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, I was young at the time, so I couldn't even imagine that. Like, you're not, nobody's your mother or father anymore. So I thought that's when he stopped. Ma'am, did you want to say something? I didn't speak and I wanted to ask. Oh, you if you finish, if you finish that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Speak. No, I wanted to speak. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. She wanted to talk. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, let me go. Okay. The reason I'm talking is I can't get you guys to talk. Oh, okay. 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 I just came. I didn't know about this. Uh -huh. but. I don't like it either. No, no, right. no, you ain't the well, first. Okay. Yeah, the first. okay. <laughs> My name is Hazel Hicks. I was born in Mississippi. Right. I was brought up on a farm. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough to be brought up on my grandfather's farm. My grandfather had a farm where they raised everything, you know, mm -hmm. from cows to pigs to this to cotton, everything, they grew it. But I was the, my mother had 11 children. I was the youngest of 11. And um, everybody worked on the farm. But I was too young to go to, you know, put cotton business stuff. And I was too young to stay at home to take care of my uh, nieces and nephews. So at the end of the field, my mother made a tent and I used to go into the tent and keep two of my nieces and nephews in, in the tent. Uh, when it was water time, I would have to go and get the water and bring it back to the field and mm -hmm. go around. Everybody drank from the same dipper. Mm -hmm. They all drank from the same one. Then when I would go back to babysit, my mother would leave the farm early. My father was in World War I. He was away. So we would go home at 12 o'clock and eat that my mother had prepared. At 12 o'clock, well in the morning, before they went to the field, they had a big breakfast, like the biscuits and grits and all that. Then at 12 o'clock, they ate a lot. At 12 o'clock, they had a, okay. at 12 o'clock, they had another, you know, full meal. And at night they ate again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah they, and um, so I was brought up pretty well. We was never hungry. One thing about it, because we grew everything, and all the cousins and things was on the same farm, right? My mother was a very good cook. She, you know, when my father came and stuff. Well, after he came home from the service, he like kind of wandered away from city to city. He liked travel. I don't know, he had traveling in his blood, I guess. So my mother stayed there with us, which was hard to raise all the 11 children, but my father wasn't, you know, always home. So uh, people used to ask her that it was hard to give some of us to, to them, you know, how people down south used to give one another them. But she never would. She said, no, I want all my children together. So she raised all 11 of us. When I see the old farmhouse now, I wonder, where did we sleep? I don't know. Because it wasn't, it wasn't two or three bedrooms. I, I, I don't know. I can't remember that. But anyway, when I got old enough, I mean, I seen how they were being treated. You know, in the South, you had to go in the store, you had to buy clothes, but you couldn't try them on. You couldn't sit at the counters to eat. And, you know, things like this. So as I got old, I always said, I'm not going to, I'm going to eat where I want, I'm going to do what I want, because I always said that. So when I was in high school, there was a girl that was in my class, she went to F.W. Woodward. Everybody remember that story? Yeah. yeah. Okay. She, she, she sit at the corner. Yeah. She was 18. That's why she was, she was arrested. She was in high school. She was arrested and she spent X amount of time in jail. So when she got released, she wanted to come back to finish high school. So when she came back to finish high school, 
we had all decided as a group that if they don't let her come back, we was going to walk out to school. So she did come back. They asked the, uh, I forget, the board, whoever was over the school, the superintendent. Mm -hmm. So they refused her to come back to finish school. Mm -hmm. So we all walked out. It was in the 60s it was when they had the Freedom Houses. Mm -hmm. So we walked, we all went to the Freedom House and they made us sign, you know, saying whatever the sign was. So we was going to walk down to the uh, superintendent to the office. So we all marched down. I guess about a hundred of us. We marched down. And as we, each one of us was supposed to step on the courthouse stairs and pray. So as we stepped up there, they would arrest us. Mm -hmm. So then finally, uh, a mob of people, white people came, and they were going to attack us. Mm -hmm. So I know we forget to policeman, I guess he blew the horn and said, arrest all those in, you know. Mm -hmm. So they threw us all in jail. Mm -hmm. We were sweating, we would just see us singing, we shall overcome. So we was all arrested in the jail cell, piled up, we still was singing, and some of us was fainting and this and stuff. So they put over the radio that if your child had come home from school today, mm -hmm. they were down to jail. Uh -huh. So my mother said that if she didn't have to hear it anymore, she knew I was there. <laughs> so, so she came down to get me. So you had to step up on this. You had to, as they call you, come up there and they would tell you would tell them uh, who your parents was and who they worked for and things like that. Because mm. whoever you work for, they they would fire you, the parents, mm. if really? you participated. So when they brought me up. <laughs> I, my mother was there, and, and I, they said, uh, where do you live? I told them, I said, what's your mother's name? I told them, they said, where do your mother work? I said, she don't work. I said, where do your father work? I said, he don't work. So they said, take her back downstairs until she learn how to talk. So, so my mother said, I was telling the truth, but I wouldn't go into detail. Yeah. So my mother said, tell him, tell him. So you said, go, tell him. So finally, because my mother was so sad, I told them, right? So I went home. So we all went home. So we went back to school the next day. We went back to school the next day. They uh, wanted to put all of us on probation. So we decided we was a group and we wasn't going on probation because if one did, we were going to get separated. So we all decided not to do that. So they suspended us from all the schools in the state of Mississippi. Oh, wow. yeah. so, so there was a private college in Jackson, Mississippi called Campbell College. It was black. So they took us into this college, right? And we used to get donations and funds from different organizations. They never told because they couldn't tell who it was. So we invaded the private and the college kids. So we stayed there for that year. And then we were able to go back to the school. So some of the children that was in the 12th grade, believe it or not, they didn't get a chance to graduate because they were at that college. So what happened was about two years ago, they had the graduation, which I was able to pretend to go back. Right? And they had their graduation at the college, right? At the school, at the high school. So we went back to the graduation. But before that, the reason how I ended up here was that they had bum in front of our house. So my mother tried to get me to stop participating in Freedom Rise, and I, I didn't want to stop. So she kept <laughs> telling me to stop. So, so I went down to the same store, Woodworth, me and my friend, to eat again. So my mother didn't get me. She said, why did you do that? You had to eat before you left. <laughs> anyway, different things kept happening. And my mother said, if you going to get us all killed, huh? you need to stop, you need to stop. <laughs> so finally, they sent me away. They sent me here to New Hampshire. Oh. I had a, a cousin that was in Grand Fear Air Force Base. So she sent me away so that I would, you know, get hurt or death or whatever. <laughs> so she sent me away. So that's how I, because I could never get a job there anyway because they had a list. They kept it. They didn't have computers then. They had a list. Uh, everyone that participated in the walkout, they would uh, they wouldn't be able to get a job there. So that's how I ended up here. But my mother, we you know we lived pretty good, and I came here and you know went to college, which we are. 
and I graduated, and I worked for 25 years with a family daycare program. Mm -hmm. So I retired. So, 
if anyone has any questions, then please feel free to ask me. And I'm going to show up more with everything. And, and well. here's my last two that I forgot. I work very closely with the Alzheimer's um, Disease Research Center, and, and so I get a lot of flyers of the Wellness Technology Lab is, they're looking for people who 18 years old and are a full-time at-home caregiver to a family member, partner, or friend with Alzheimer's disease. You play a video game, you receive $50. Okay, so if anybody knows anybody who's taking care of anybody, and this is a sleep, um, sleep Alzheimer's disease study on sleep, 535 dollars so if you're taking care of someone with Alzheimer's or dementia or you know anybody who is, yes. who would like to make some money for, um, I don't think you have to take any drugs or anything, I think it's just, so anybody who's looking for extra money, and so thank you guys, all of you for coming, I totally appreciate it. Um, we're going to wrap it up now, talk to each other, there's lunch over here, I'm going to open it up, there's cake. I didn't expect this many, so I'm not sure we're going to have to all take little bites for lunch, but thank you all so much for coming up.